I would have to say that history allowed me to see that it's not only in the past, that history permeates everywhere in society, that you can see history everywhere around you, that you can see the legacies of history. And that's why I say that history lives on, history lives on into the present, because it's very interesting and to see that us as individuals, we actually carry the pen that writes history. And that pen is ourselves, our journeys, who we are as a people. Hello, my friend. Welcome to Something for Everybody. My name is Aaron Mashvitz. Kareem, welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much for having me. All right, before we dive into uh, everything that you're doing, which I'm very excited to talk to you about, I have the most important question I would like to ask you, and that is, um, how are you doing? Like, really, how are you doing? Uh, there's so many ways to answer this question. To start off, I think I would just say good, but many times I can also say confused. Um, to be honest, I'm good, but I'm discovering things as we were just talking about before we started recording this episode. I feel like many times there are so many things that we want to do with our lives, and it all depends as well on the people that we have around us, what they push us to do, what they push us not to do. Many times we may have a passion that we want to do, a passion that we want to fulfill, and it all depends on if people support us or if people don't support us. Like we were talking about before, that I released something in my uh, I released a video on my youtube channel about friendship and if people support us or not and this is something that i had to come to terms with when it comes to regulating my different passions what i do what i don't do so this is a very long answer to the question about how am i yeah great i i want to i want to touch on um most of those things that you just said but before that um before we dive into friendship and support and maybe the idea of over-specialization, um, things of that nature, right? I, I would like to just, <clears throat> I would like to know your origin story. Like what what got you here? I know that's a, that's a large question, so take yeah. it however you'd like. But um, uh, yeah, let us know. Okay, so for those who aren't aware, um, my name is Karim Wafa. I'm also known as Karim Wafa Al-Husseini. I am a historian, a writer, a poet. I also am a geopolitical analyst. That's my specialization, what I studied in college. Um, I also uh, do a lot of research concerning languages and anthropology. So my main passions, I have like two main passions, to be honest. I'm just juggling them. One of them is more academic. So that's everything to do with history, race, identity, um, and history in general. And on the other hand, it's everything to do with personal development, um, the arts, um, and basically mental health motivation so it's basically these two different things but two different things that i feel many times can also be very linked together at the same time um especially when it comes to like how things that we go through every single day in our day-to-day -day lives that may be linked to history so this is something that i tend to tackle on my social media platforms for example my instagram i post a lot of things related to motivation and to poetry whereas on my twitter it's mainly academic and history so yeah, it's a bit of everything to be honest, but yeah, that's how I started to discover what I like and what I don't like. And how did you basically come to terms that it was okay for you to do multiple things, for you to pursue multiple passions? Because <clears throat> very rarely in life does, does a single person find one thing that they feel is meaningful and purposeful to them. They're out there. It is out there. It's hard sometimes to figure it out because you have to try different things. You have to be curious. You have to be willing to sort of fall down and then stand back up and fall down and then, okay, stumble upon this thing that might be the thing that you want to pursue, whether as a job or a hobby, that can still be your purpose. But you you found multiple things. Um, I, I mean, I don't know if there's a question of how or maybe you just like to run through some of your process. To be honest, if there is one thing that I could say, it's to listen to, I, this is going to sound very cheesy, to be honest, but it's listening to my heart. Because I do feel like many times we can get sucked into what do other people want us to do, that we may sometimes force things which are unnatural to us, or yeah, to our own individual personality. So the most important thing for me was just listening to what I like to do. I mean, during my free time, what I would usually always do is either meditate on the one hand or read books on the other. So it's through reading that I discovered my passion for history, 
But it's also since I was a kid, I mean, my family's from the Middle East. I'm Arab, but my family come from all over the Middle East, different countries. So from the Middle East and North Africa. So that's how I start to um, basically learn more about my history. And that's how questions about history, race and identity began to actually come into my mind. So that also tied into art because my dad is also a poet. So I started to like question myself and question my passions. And this questioning led me to like basically discovering a, a path for me, if that makes sense, a career path, which is being a historian, being a writer, but also using whatever I know, my experiences growing up concerning motivation and mental health. So the most important thing for me, to be honest, is literally, despite how cheesy it sounds, but to listen to your heart honestly and to see what you enjoy doing. Yeah. I mean, I agree with that statement of listen to your heart, follow your intuition, trust your gut. But it's, you don't get there by, a, I mean, a meditation is a, is, a, is a wonderful place to get there, right? Because you're sitting with yourself, you're thinking about breathing and channeling your inner wisdom and how can I uh, control my self-deception and how can I transform myself? And then you start to learn that you're a person who can trust their gut. But if you're not earning that trust in yourself by doing sort of these things daily, then it's hard for someone to follow their gut or intuition or say five years ago, their their gut or their intuition led them down a really bad path. And now they, they have a hard time doing that. So it's, <clears throat> you're right, yeah. but it can be hard for some people. Do you have any advice about how to how to work sort of through that? And I think, to be honest, like what you just said, the main thing also is who's in your circle, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because to me, especially, I've noticed, especially in the past, when I was surrounding myself with people that didn't believe in me, and I thought that they were friends, I realized that they made me question my passions, they made me question my gut feeling, when all along that was what was telling me that they were not for me. And the moment that I started telling myself that I'm not gonna hang out with people that do not believe in me, that's when I started to discover my passions even more. Because when you have alone time, you can think. When you have alone time, you can generally, like you just said, sit down by yourself, which may not be easy for everybody, to be honest. It's not hard, it's not easy for everyone. It can be very hard. However, it's saying it's okay. And it's important for me to take something, take some time for myself and do whatever I see is best for me. And to me, it was, I'm not going to say isolation, but taking some alone time, having some alone time. And that made me discover what I actually do love doing. I started trying out different hobbies, trying out different things. And I realized that there is a specific path or paths, multiple paths that do arouse my curiosity. Hmm. And in the beginning, when I asked you, how are you, you said uh, one word that pops up is confused. Can we can we go back to that? And what does that mean? When I said confused, I think it's because of the fact that and I said this in a previous interview of mine as well, which was interesting because they were like, Kareem, how is it being a polymath in today's world, like being a polymath, which essentially means having a specialization, in so many different things. For me, it's OK. However, in today's world, many times we tend to be pushed to do one thing. We tend to be pushed into one specific thing, into a box, into a label. And to me, that's usually the word that comes into my mind, because when people tell you that you can do so many things and then you're here doing so many different things, it's like, is there something wrong with me or is there something not wrong with me? You know, so it's that self questioning that, you know, that you start to ask yourself questions. You start to wonder if you're actually doing the right thing, if there's something else that you're supposed to be doing. So that's exactly why sometimes you may ask yourself, what path am I on? You know, mm -hmm. so that's why I would say confused, especially, but today, the more I learn about what I like, what I don't like, the more certain I am that it doesn't matter what other people think. It's more what I think and what I think is best for me personally as an individual. Yeah. Do you feel like there was a a path that you were supposed to be on, like that was already determined for you and you chose a different one? Or what was that like? There can be very interesting answers to this question. For example, at school, I remember um, I've always had a passion for, so like I said, history, languages and culture and so many different things. So people used to say, oh, Kareem, you're probably going to be a diplomat or something, something in like the political realm. And despite the fact that I studied politics in college, for me, I never saw myself doing that. 
for a living, I was like, I like to be the master of my own destiny. So if somebody tells me you need to go there on a trip for this, you need to go and do this, I'm going to deploy you here and there. I didn't see that fit for me. Mm. And the more people would ask me like, oh, so how is the career in diplomacy going? I'm like, I'm not doing that. And sometimes it was hard for them to understand, especially because they're like, you study politics equals you become a diplomat. But I'm like, no, I study politics. So at least I can understand how the world works. It doesn't matter how I implement that. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that's that's one of the paths that I was pushed to take, despite the fact that I decided not to take it. Mm. Yeah. Politics are an interesting one. I uh, very interesting. I um, have a lot of respect, let's say, for those that choose that as a career path, because regardless of what side of the fence you on or what policies you have, there will be a majority of people who despise you, exactly. no matter what. And you could you could probably say that about like. A lot of professions, especially like you and I who are public facing and post things on social media platforms, like I could say like all dogs are beautiful and we should cherish them. And there'll be a few comments that say, well, what about cats? Maybe that was my next post. You know what I mean? And so exactly. things like that are, are always going to happen. Um, and uh, that shies a lot of people away from doing the thing they wish to do. And that and that sucks because you know you want people to live out this passion. There, you want them to be able to express their unique gifts in service of the world. I think that's the most important thing, and that's beautiful. That's obviously what you're doing. Um, but on a political uh, space, or even like you know, you and I, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, like there's always going to be someone who disagrees with us, and that disagreement is really important. But it it also depends on how they disagree with you. Like if you 100%. made a post and I'm like, mm, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't really follow along with that. Can you explain why you think that way? And then we have a discourse about it. And now we're like, have this beautiful understanding about where you're coming from, and where I'm coming from. That's the dialogue we need to be having. Not, hey, you're a fucking idiot. That shit was stupid. That's it. And I feel like um, people, people can't see that sometimes. They're just like, they just see the insult. They just see the comment and they can't see beyond that. And that's the thing. I'm going to be honest, one of the hardest things that I had to come to terms with, especially when I decided to be, I don't like the term influencer, but to like post on social media was mm -hmm. the idea that not everybody's going to agree with you and that's okay. I mean, I remember when I first got a couple of my first hate comments, I was like, wait a minute, why are these people being mean to me? And I went to my parents and I'm like, why are these people rude? Like what's going on? And they're like, oh no, that's normal. You made it. If you have a hater, you made it. And <laughs> For me, I'm going to be honest, like in my mind, I'm like, everybody's supposed to be nice. Like, where's this negativity coming from? And I'm going to be honest, I've come to terms with it. And I honestly just ignore it at this point, because I remember I used to watch this talk show called The Real Daytime. I would watch it all the time. And Tamara, one of the hosts, she used to say, you know that you've made it when you have your first hater. And to be honest, I tend to agree with that now, because the thing is that once you have your own opinion, you're actually not afraid to show the, to the world that actually you have an idea about a certain matter and the fact that a lot of people won't agree with you, it doesn't really matter. That's just what they think. And that should not stop you from doing whatever you want to do on your journey. And despite the fact that it is something which everybody must come to terms with, it can be very hard, especially at the start, which is what stops people from like posting on social media, which is what stops people from showing themselves to the world because they're, they have this fear of, being hated on the sphere of negativity, which is something that we're just supposed to come to terms with. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard because yeah. it's, it's like in our innate beings as humans is to want to be liked by other people. Mm. And some that sometimes that gets us in trouble because now we are just agreeing sometimes agreeing to agree. Right. So this person thinks that I'm on their side or I'm on this side of the fence so they think that I'm this like morally right person, even though those virtues are unearned and I don't even actually have these like thought out opinions on the subject. I'm just agreeing to agree because I want to be liked. Um, and then you go on sort of the other side where you start to like stand firm on your ground in this position that you believe to be true. And then you start posting. Then you get all of this whatever uh, feedback, let's say, in the best term possible from people. And then it starts to waver a little bit because then you can – 
you know, that's good that you're getting feedback because then you can do a little bit more research for me or for you. Like, okay, do I really believe this to be true? Is this the thing that I hold dear? Like, are these comments? Yes, they're, uh, they're covered in a lot of things that are not nice, but the underlying thing is like, maybe I got something wrong or maybe I missed something. And then it gives us a chance to dive deeper into that. And then after all of that sort of research and feedback, we're like, okay, yes, I do believe this is true. I do believe that all dogs are beautiful and we should cherish them, even though cats are also important as well. Uh, sticking on <laughs> the same metaphor that I used at the beginning, but it's hard. It's, it was hard for me when I, you know, cause I started basically posting about mental health because of a very personal thing that happened to me. And even talking about that, you get different sorts of feedback. Like you're not supposed to talk about that. It's weak to talk about that. Like you should, um, save your feelings to yourself, stop being an attention seeker, like all of this stuff. And then you start to realize that people are just are, are struggling. Like that's why they're, they're posting that stuff. Cause they're, they're having a really hard time with their own life and they haven't taken an internal look at the darkness that's within, within them. So they only see the darkness that's when other people, and they haven't integrated that with the light and all of the stuff that's just happening all over the world. That's why we have so many issues is because people haven't integrated the light with the dark and seen that in themselves so they can see that in other people to create this like integration. But yeah, not a question there, but maybe you have a few comments on that. No, a hundred percent. And to be honest, this is something that I have noticed exactly like you. I mean, that's the thing when a lot of people are just like throwing hate left, right and center. Many times you notice that it is something within them that they can't come to terms with. So they're going to project it onto you. And that's a very easy way to be safe for them. But how little do they know that in reality, they are deepening the issue because they're not actually addressing what they're going through. They're not addressing the main issues that they have, whether it being mentally, emotionally, whatever. But in general, that's the thing. That's one of the, the defense mechanisms that a lot of people use. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I, I recently watched your uh, YouTube video on um, if they don't support you, right? Mm -hmm. Very important. Very important. Um, what, um, uh, drove you to make that video? Was it something personal that happened? Was it something you just been thinking about regularly or what led you there? I think a combination of both, to be honest, on the one hand, I've always wanted to start posting videos about mental health, motivation, friendship, these types of stuff, especially for the past six months to, to seven months especially even because of the fact that growing up i was always a bit different from the other kids i would get picked on a lot i mean i've had some things especially at school socially where a lot of people wouldn't see me like everybody else so i would be picked on because i was different i mean when all the kids would be out in recess playing around i would just be in the library reading books that was just me right i was the nerd type i was the history geek i was always in the dusty old book section reading books so that was always my passion and that's actually how my passion of history was actually birthed because of the fact that i was not like anybody else i was pushed to read and through reading i discovered something so that's what i see as a domino effect but when I say they don't support you, I came to that conclusion after going through things with friends, after noticing that a lot of the people I would surround myself with weren't people that were always there for me, especially when they're people that you think are like your backbone. Mm -hmm. They're actually not there for you when you need them. And that's something can, that can be very damaging, especially when you rely on people to support you when you don't support yourself, which is why I always say support yourself no matter what. And that's why I decided to film that video, because I do know that a lot of people go through these things. And the more I talk about these things, especially on Instagram through motivational posts and poetry, poetry that deals with emotions. Um, I've, I've had a lot of people say that you're helping me, you're helping me deal with things. And this is something that makes me happy because I realized that despite the fact that I was told that there was nothing special about me, this and that, I realized that they knew that there was something in me that they didn't want me to share. And that's why I always say that's, that's one sentence I always say, if they say you can't do it is because they know that you can, but they don't want you to. And that's something that we need to come to terms with, especially when we surround our, ourselves with people in our own circles that really don't see the light in us or that see the light in us, but don't want us to see it for ourselves. Yeah. It's all, it's all an internal projection. I mean, the mm. same thing we were talking about with the comments is the same thing here. If I am your friend and I see you elevating yourself and growing and transforming and just becoming this full embodied 
best version of you and I'm still stuck at the same level I was five years ago because I'm a little scared to take that leap. I'm feeling uncomfortable. I'm feeling a little insecure. And you were feeling the exact same way, but you decided to take the leap anyways. I want to pull you back down mm -hmm. so we can stay at this comfortable place together so I don't feel alone and like I couldn't get the job done. When I could have just followed you on the path, you walked it for me and I can just walk with you on it. But instead, I'm trying to pull you back down because that's an internal projection the same way someone would post a comment. And <clears throat> I say all that, it's not easy to see that and notice that in a friend, right? Because you have this friendship that you've blossomed probably. And that person ultimately decided that they don't want what's best for you. Um, and we usually get to see that when we go through our hardest moments, mm -hmm. right? And like, that's when we need our people the most. That's when we need someone to hug us or say it's going to be okay or a shoulder to cry on or like that text randomly throughout the day that just says, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about you. And like, wow. Yeah. That means but the instead most they're. What's that? It means the most. Like you just said, when you get that comment, when you get that support, even when you don't ask for it, that's when you know that they're always there for you. But like my parents always tell me, and they've been telling me this since I was a kid, you don't know who your true friends are when you're happy. You know it when you're sad and when you're going through the worst tests and trials in your life because they show up for you if they truly care. And if they don't show up for you, they don't, they don't care. And it was just a facade. It was just a mask they were putting on just to make you feel happy when in reality, now you know who they truly are. Yeah. Like sometimes we just have friends of convenience. That is you know, so like... true. So true. And so many friendships are based on convenience because I, I don't know if I was watching a video or reading an article, but somebody was saying that many times our friends are not friends that we picked, but friends that we choose to stick around with because of the fact that they're always there. Like you're just hanging out with them because they're always free for you. But that doesn't mean that they are there for you. Not because they're free, right. they're always there. And we need to be able to understand the difference between two things because sometimes we can confuse them and see them as synonyms, whereas actually that doesn't mean that they genuinely care and will be there to support you during your challenges and during your tests, your trials, the obstacles that you're going through in your every day to day life. So that's why friendship is so important. But the thing is that people don't see friendship for what it truly is, because many times they just say, I'm going out with friends, but who are your friends? Choose your friends carefully because who you surround yourself with is who is actually going to shape you. They always say, tell me who your five friends are and I tell you who you are. And that is exactly what is so true because whether we like it or not, many times the people we surround ourselves with, they project their energies onto us. And so we can think about it in a very energetical sense, in a very metaphysical sense, like when we talk about the light chakras and energy, but we can also think about it on the other hand, in a very psychological way, energy vampires, we can think about it as um, negative vibes or good vibes. So many times people say you don't choose your friends, but yes, you do choose your friends because I have noticed that when somebody's not good for me, I just cut them out. And I used to be scared to cut people out, but now I do it very commonly. And I've noticed that they come back running after me. They're like, oh, hey, Karim, remember we were friends? No, we were not friends. I just let you into my life. But that doesn't mean that you cared. And for some reason, now you want to come back. Like, I'm not okay with that trauma anymore. I've leveled up, but you're still at that level. And that's why you want to keep on pulling me down, like you just said, because many times people cannot come to terms with the fact that somebody genuinely wants to improve and that they don't want to improve. So they're trying to bring you back down to how you were before. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the friends of convenience thing is super interesting because people assume that if we spend a lot of time together that we're quote unquote good friends. And that's not true because it depends on how you're spending that time. Are you spending it just at bars, going out, drinking alcohol? You're not really getting to know someone there. You're just using that person to do whatever you're trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're spending an hour each week at a coffee shop, like just talking about a book you're reading or uh, just chatting, that like that's real conversation right there. The phone's away. And you're, that's That time is way more valuable than the six hours we spent, you know, going out to whatever, 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 right? That's a real friend or, or you're trying to cultivate a real friendship there because just like you know, right? Relationships of any sort, romantic partner, family, friendship, they take time and effort and attention. And 
you're moving like an inch forward each time, like expressing a little more vulnerability, being a, more, a little bit more truthful, showing more of yourself, like, like almost giving your heart to this person, hopefully that they don't just throw it on the ground and stomp on it. Sometimes they do. And heartbreak is, is part of the process of cultivating beautiful relationships. And we're all going to have to go through that. But the ones that hold that heart and they put it and they carry it well, like you only need a couple of those, you know, those are the most beautiful things that we have because nobody does anything great alone and we need support and we need love and we have to be willing to put ourselves out there to receive that love and to also give that love. And it's, it could start with friendships, who you choose to be your friends um, and who you choose to spend your time with. And, you know, I think, I think great friendships are built on three aspects. One being your friend celebrates your successes way more than you even celebrate them. Mm -hmm right? They yeah. hold you accountable when you don't live up to your end of the bargain. They're like, dude, that's not what you said you would do. Um, but they also give you forgiveness for that, but they're holding you accountable for your shit. And three, maybe the most important one, they sit in the dark with you when you're going through your worst times. They're willing to literally carry you when you can't walk because you've gone through something that's so hard and painful and they're right there with you and they walk you into the light. Okay, we have to do it ourselves also, right? No one can take care of ourselves for us. We have to do that work, but we can have that helping hand. We can have that support. We can have that linked arm. And I think when you're thinking about a friendship, think about those three aspects and then watch your video on you know, five toxic friendships um, and then put those things together and figure out which relationships are really the ones that you want to keep long term. Because you, you can't cultivate 75 relationships. You can maybe do three. One being like a romantic partner and a couple friendships. And then your family, if that's the people you choose to hang out with or love or cultivate a relationship with. So those things are all very important. And you have to take sort of an inventory and check in on that. Because it will, it will dictate the trajectory of your life. A hundred percent. And that's the thing, like you were just saying, you can't nur nurture and flourish so many different types of friendships, especially like if they're more than three, five or six people want to say that they're friends with like 100 people. But that's the thing, you're not friends with 100 people, you just like know them as acquaintances. Because that's the thing, you cannot give time and effort and energy 24 seven to 100 people. And many of us can't even give all that energy to our own selves. So how are we going to expect to give that to others if we can give it to ourselves or to each other? So that's the thing. And especially when you were saying about how people sometimes do not appreciate friendship or relationships, that's something that's so true. And I have noticed it, especially if that makes sense after the pandemic as well, mm -hmm. because of the fact that one th good thing that I liked about being so-called in lockdown, if I could say that there's one good thing that I liked about it was the fact that a lot of people that never had their own self-talk with themselves, they managed to have their own conversation. They managed to discover what they actually like. It can be with your passion, with your career, but also when it comes to discovering yourself, like what you genuinely enjoy doing. And that's so interesting because you look at so many statistics after the pandemic and there's so many people starting their own businesses, so many people starting their own passion, starting their own YouTube channels, starting so many different things that they do to support themselves. And that's something that we would have not seen if that had not happened. But also a negative thing is the fact that a lot of people have become selfish. And I have noticed that as well. Mm. I mean, there's a big difference between self-love and being selfish. And unfortunately, I always tell people like, just because terms may sound similar or because they may have some things that are a bit similar doesn't mean that they're the same. When you have self-love, you love yourself. You generally love yourself. But when you're selfish, you're self-absorbed. You think of yourself as being better than other people. And that's something that I have noticed, especially to the extreme, because of the fact that people don't give the time, effort and energy to nurture relationships. There was that metaphor that I was reading on. I think it was a couple of weeks ago. Somebody was saying there's a difference when you love somebody and when you just like someone. When you like a flower, you pick it from the ground. When you love the flower, you water it every day so it can grow. You don't just pick mm. it up and then you throw it off. You just throw it on the side of the road and you just stomp on it like you just said with someone's heart. Like it's seeing something grow because you care about it or just picking it enjoying it once and then just throwing it on the side there's a big difference between love and like and that is one of the biggest things that i feel like people need to discover learn or come to terms with absolutely yes and they can do that through 
uh, many things. One being a meditation practice, which we which we talked about, um, and also a creative process. Um, you don't have to be, you don't have to consider yourself a creative person to have a creative endeavor, right? Um, but speaking of that, do you consider yourself a creative person? I do. I do. Honestly, I do. And it's interesting you ask that because even as I was a kid growing up, that's one of the things a lot of people used to describe me as they're like, he's creative more than anything else, because I was always into art if that makes sense, not only writing, but also drawing, painting, all different types of art. I found art a very interesting way to express myself because one thing that I like about it that is not analytical or logical is the fact that you can express yourself as a person through different forms of self-expression. So it can be through colors, through writing, through um, something that you're sculpting, if you like building sculptures, anything. When art is so interesting because it gives you the ability to turn into a tangible and physical reality, something that you have in your mind. So for me now, today in this day and age, is poetry. I love writing poetry. And this is something that I feel is very interesting because there are no rules. When it comes to poetry, you just write like a river. It flows. The words, they just flow from your mouth onto the paper. And that's so interesting because of the fact that it allows you to understand your emotions, even if you don't understand them while you're writing them. So what's so interesting with poetry, and I've seen artists speak about that as well, when they paint, when they draw. When I was a kid, a young kid, I used to just draw. I used to never write poetry up until the age of seven. Seven or eight, I started discovering poetry, writing. And then I realized that my dad was a poet. So I was like, why not do that as well? Despite the fact that my dad just writes poetry in Arabic, I only write poetry in English. But I do sometimes use Arabic linguistics and Arabic metaphors because it's one of the world's richest languages. So I've discovered the richness of Arabic literature, despite the fact that I'm not fluent in Arabic literature because of the fact that it has over 12 million words, whereas the English language has only 500,000 words. Cool. What is so, yeah, exactly. That's why it's known to be the world's richest language. It is spoken in over 22 countries. So um, as an Arab myself, I, I'm very proud of that. But as well, on the other hand, it can be very intimidating trying to understand the rich legacy of art, history and culture. But on the other hand, for me, it's an opportunity to take, if that makes sense, academia and history and literature and all these things and turn it into art. Because sometimes, especially through not only writing, but also through music, dance, like you just said, creative processes can link us to other things and give us the chance to see how things are linked to other processes. For example, art can be linked to history. And I personally study um, Arabic literature as well as Arabic music, Arabic dance, storytelling, all these different things. And I've noticed how that is linked to history, how conquests and migrations and all these different things influence the way that we tell stories, the way that we write poetry, the way that musical instruments develop. And that is art, that is self-expression and how these things are linked to history, which is so beautiful and so interesting, but also a lot of people aren't aware of. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. I would definitely consider you a creative person, by the way. Thank you. Um, what, what does um, studying history uh, play into your, your current day-to-day -day role as a creative person? Do you, do you take stuff that you're learning and try to um, reason it to what's happening, say in our everyday lives, or or what's what's, or you just like to study it to learn about it, and then maybe try to apply it to now. Okay, when I talk about like studying history, what is so interesting is that a lot of people always say the first thing that they say when I say my passion is history. I'm a historian. They're like, oh, that's quite boring, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, before you say it's boring, what's so interesting is that history, the way that we're taught it at school, is very boring. It's not very interactive. You're just given a textbook, you're given a piece of paper, told to read this chapter of history, and that's it. But what's so nice about history is that for me, if you ask me, history is alive everywhere. Because I personally see it in front of me. And if I can go into the details, for example, when I started to examine um, history from my part of the world, Afro-Arab history, it actually started when I would look around and I noticed items of clothing, I noticed stories, I noticed 
even dance styles and musical styles that were not only linked to Arab culture, but that were linked to various aspects of African culture. So for me, it was that question mark that made me wonder, how is it possible that so many things that we talk about or that we do today, if it's in the realm of the arts and culture, but also traditional items of clothing that we have across the Middle East, how are these things linked to our history and how different chapters of human history, especially in the Middle East, because that's one of my areas of specialization, how did conquest, migration, slavery, all of these different things impact the way that we talk, the way that we dress, the way that um, we even celebrate because so many musical styles and dance styles evolved in the Middle East because of the slave trade. So this is so interesting as well, because before studying Afro-Arab history, my main passion growing up as a kid has always been African-American history. And the first book I ever bought as a kid was the autobiography of Frederick Douglass. So studying that gave me more insights into studying Afro-Arab history. So it's interesting because I could see the links between two different things, you see? and to see how that expresses itself into everyday life. So how history, like you just said, when you were asking me the question is that I don't just see history as something on a textbook. I see it as something that is alive every day. And that's why I personally decided to start writing history. And I finished my first history book called about Afro-Arab history. It's currently almost in the process of being published. And that's actually one of the ways that I can take history and turn it into an actual reality. Because not only am I seeing it around me, not only am I reading about it, but I'm actively engaging in the production of history. Because I feel like so much of our history, especially in the non-Western world, has not been given as much credit. So that's mm. a good way when you see someone from the community talking about their own history. You know what I mean? Wow. Well, cheers, man. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it'll, let's, let's have you back on the podcast so we can promote that when it comes out. Definitely. Just let me know. I'll be back. Um, but a question about history, because history, as you're talking about, is a lot of the parts of history are very painful, right? Very mm -hmm. painful. There's a lot of death. There's a lot of mass tragedy. There's a lot of slavery. And so when you study that, you personally, does it make you more optimistic about the future that we've gotten a little bit better? Obviously, some of these things still exist. Mm -hmm. Um, but does it make you more optimistic? Does it make you scared? Does it make you more in love with humanity or does it make you come to terms with your own darkness that these are human beings who did this stuff and you're also a human being? Like what is, what does that, um, translate for you? That is such a good question. To be honest, I think that, yeah, like you just said, the more we see the darkness in human history, it can give us hope for the future. But the thing is that the more you see that a lot of people don't give credit to history and a lot of people don't study history, it also makes you think that we're never going to learn about all of the wrong things, about all of our mistakes that we've done in the past, if we don't actually acknowledge them. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, because I feel like we need to look at history, like you just said, because it, it is mainly dark, it is very dark, and it is a very sad history in general we talk about the history of the world there's a lot of pain but there also is a lot of beauty as well and it depends on the eyes and the perspectives that we use i mean what is beauty to who and like we just say beauty is in the eye of the beholder because some chapters of human history may be beautiful for some people and they may, may be very dark and gruesome to others but as we're all human beings we can definitely agree that there are some things that are good and some things that are bad and the thing is that the more we acknowledge and the more we study history the more we give history a voice or to people that study history the more we give them a voice the easier it will be for future the future generations to be more you know less inclined to reproduce the mistakes that have happened in the past because when people aren't aware of what has happened they may not think that's a bad thing and they may lead to the reproduction of that very chapter of human history yeah yeah i mean there's obviously tons of beautiful things that history mm. gave us, as you've mentioned, right? The art, the, the history, the sculptures, the, the beautiful things that, that people have made, right? There's all human beings who are doing these things, whether it's the atrocities that human beings are doing or whether it's the beautiful things that people have overcome and built out of the atrocities, right? They're mm -hmm. both things are important and both things have to be measured. Because it's important to study those facts because you have to understand the capabilities 
of some of these people, right? And how little small decisions over time led to these mass things happening. And then you can see that pulse or hopefully pick that up sooner in current day reality so we can prevent these things from ever happening ever again. Um, but we have to know, I think the most important thing to know is that human beings, like I said, are doing these things. And if we think that we are these perfect people who are not capable of doing these things, then we haven't come to terms with our capacity for evil as people. And I was not in those situations. I have no idea how I would have acted. I don't know what I would have done. I can't claim to be this perfect person that I would have stood up for what's right, even though my family could have been murdered or could have been thrown out or could have been just disregarded as not even real people. Like, I don't know what I would have done. I can't claim to know that, but I can claim to try and learn and understand what led to those decisions. So maybe that I can have better conversations with people about it now, where me and you can have dialogue about these things to spread the word about understanding the capabilities of good and evil and having those integrated, like we've said, um, sort of the theme of this uh, of this episode, which is great. And so I, I think there's a lot of utility in understanding that. There's a lot of utility in people like you expressing the importance of this stuff. And so I'll just acknowledge you for, for doing that good work. Thank you. And to be honest, like I do feel the important thing is not to look at history and see it as a taboo, because the more you see it as a taboo, the more you think that you can talk about that. And the more you think that history is something that should be looked at, that shouldn't be addressed, that shouldn't be given a voice. And as you just said, the more you look at history, the more you study history, the more you realize that history is something that we can use to improve ourselves, the more we can use to connect as communities despite the fact that we do have physical and geographical borders, they have not always been there and they are a product of history. And like you said as well, what is very interesting, and that's something that I talk about a lot when it comes to the realm of the arts and culture, when it comes to Afro-Arab music, art, dance, all these different things, is how humans can be so resilient and how people mm. can turn something that is so dark and gruesome into works of art, into amazing things. It's just like, looking at the creations of so many different musical genres and styles in the US and looking about how the transatlantic slave trade and the plantation system led to the creation of jazz, blues, country music as well to a certain extent and so many different genres of music that were influenced by horrible chapters of human history just like we see in the eastern world in the middle east how the indian ocean trade or the indian ocean slave trade which is one of the chapters that i study led to the creation of some of the most famous arab styles of music but people don't know that they're linked to history so that's the interesting part very interesting and and beautiful and mm -hmm. yeah wow <clears throat> to uh to sort of what's that very deep as well of course yeah i mean that all of this stuff is is deep profound and um and life-changing right that's why it leads most people when they study this to some sort of growth or transformation and so that leads me to ask you what sort of um growth or transformation have you um, had because of this stuff? Mm, this is really interesting. I think that I would have to say that history allowed me to see that it's not only in the past, that history permeates everywhere in society, that you can see history everywhere around you, that you can see the legacies of history. And that's why I say that history lives on, history lives on into the present because it's very interesting and to see that us as individuals, we actually carry the pen that writes history. And that pen is ourselves, our journeys, who we are as a people. And it all depends on what we do and how that can influence history as well, which is why for me, looking back at history, studying history is a very interesting way of discovering who I am, discovering myself, not only discovering the history of my family, like I said at the beginning of the episode, being mixed between different parts of the Middle East, but it's also realizing the resilience of humanity, how we can go through so many different things and still come out victorious and still discover and bring so many things into existence that would not even have been 
that not can, that can't even be imagined. So it's so interesting to see how history is something which many times is seen as a very unnecessary subject at school, but which at the same time can be so pivotal and is literally at the forefront of so many of the things we're going through today. That's why I say that history is revolutionary, because when we look at contemporary politics, like we were just saying at the beginning, whether it being US politics, Arab politics, African politics, European politics, how contemporary affairs around the world are still linked to decisions made by powerful men in the past or made by people in the past, and how the past links into the present and how it trickles down like a domino effect, and how history can be seen as that link. Yes. Hmm. Beautiful. Um, I uh, was was thinking about your creative process a little bit more, and I would love to hear you share any advice you have to someone who wants to do the same thing, who wants to be a poet or a writer or wants to express themselves uh, outside of just uh, talking about it like I do on this podcast. Um, any advice for them? One interesting thing is to create your own routine. And many times routines can be seen as, oh, I have a routine, but no, a routine is very interesting as well because it forces you down, it forces you to actually sit down and do something. And for me, for example, I, despite the fact that I don't follow my routine all the time, <laughs> I try and follow it and it's just sitting down and writing. It can be either poetry, if I'm in the mood to write poetry today, because I, I write poetry, but also write stories and I write nonfiction. So I write different types of things. But for me, the most important thing is to write something today. So I would just sit down and force myself to just write anything. And the thing is that many times when we sit down and write, we're like, I don't know what to write about. But that's the thing. You're not supposed to know. You're just supposed to write and see where it takes you. It's like a journey. And despite the fact that it may sound very happy and very, it's a very jolly way of saying that that's what we're supposed to do during our creative process. Writing is a very interesting way, especially if somebody wants to become a poet or it's not necessarily a routine that anybody can say is only linked to becoming a writer, because when you write, you discover things and writing is like the basis of even talking It's our scripts. When we create videos, it's so much more than that. Writing can actually turn your ideas and your thoughts into a reality. So it's a very interesting way of putting your mind on paper and seeing that that's actually what I'm thinking. That's what I want to do. Because many times we can be very confused as to what I actually want to do. But the moment you actually put your ideas and you list them down on paper, that mental clutter, that brainstorming actually comes into a reality and you see everything in front of you. So it's not always that confusing anymore. Like when you're asking at the beginning of the episode, how do you feel when some, when I said confused, the confused the confused part is not there anymore because the more you write the more you're less confused because the more you see your thoughts the more you see what you had in your mind all along and it's a very interesting way but it's also not used by a lot of people because of the fact that a lot of people think writing isn't that important and i always see people say writing isn't important but writing is the basis of so much when you write you write a plan to build a sculpture when you write you write a plan to film a video when you write you're writing so many different things so simply putting your thoughts on paper is a very interesting and it's a method that isn't given enough credit but that's something that i think a lot of people can integrate into their creative process which is something that i do believe will help people in different areas of their lives absolutely like writing anything down you know whether it's just what's in your brain on paper is a forcing function to get it out of your brain if you're trying to create clarity for the future, you're creating a vision for yourself, right? If you want to be the most capable person you can be, learn how to be sophisticated with your language, both speaking and writing. And you're someone who can then express themselves in a way where people can understand you. And then your point can come across, you can express your needs and wants, and your loved and your values and your visions. And that just comes with practice, just like anything else. And so what you're saying is, is, um, is fantastic is spot on. 100% and that's the thing because many people I feel can be very, I'm not going to say scared, but anxious, probably anxious is the word, anxious to not be perfect when they write. But that's the thing, writing can never really be perfect because, and one of the very interesting ways that I can actually turn the idea into a very easy example is when we look at stories, 
like lots of people say that this book is a bestseller. That means it's amazing. But I've seen lots of people say that bestselling books are horrible. And that's the thing. Like one very interesting book is The Alchemist. And one, The Alchemist is literally one of the books that I started reading to ignite my passion for reading. And I loved the book, but I hated the ending. And a lot of people hated the book, but they loved the ending. And that's very interesting because it just pushes you to wonder, is it the writing that made me fall in love with writing or is it the story? Mm. And the more you think about that, the more you realize that there is so much power in combining words and in combining words to make a story and in combining words to convey a message. And that's the very interesting thing about this entire world of literary academia and writing and even the creative process of writing. Yeah, it's, it's so powerful. It's one mm -hmm. of the most powerful tools we have to convey a message, a message of whatever, hopefully of hope and love and all of that stuff. So, but any, any last minute thoughts you have for us? Closing arguments, comments, concerns, questions, funny stories? I would say to everybody, listen to what you feel like you want to do. Listen to what your heart has been telling you to do. Listen to what you feel that you actually want to turn into a reality. Um, because I, at the beginning of this episode, like we were saying, that's what I told myself that I had to do in order to discover that I like doing what I like doing today. And that's a very interesting way of actually planning out your creative process because you will realize that the moment you're less confused up here, the moment everything is going to be clear. At the moment everything is clear, the moment you're going to be happier because nobody likes being confused. Nobody likes having so many ideas in their mind that they don't actually know what they're doing. And the moment you realize that everything is in order, for me, it's through writing. For other people, it's through so many different things. The more you will realize that everything is slowly falling into place. Beautiful. Where can people find you if they want uh, to check out all of your work? So they can find me on Twitter, on Instagram. On Instagram, it's K-A-R-I-M-W-A-F-A -A number one. On Twitter, it's D-R Karim Wafa. And on, yeah, I have a podcast as well called Gahwa with Karim. Gahwa is G-A-H-W-A -A, and Gahwa is the Arabic word for coffee. And the way that I came up with the idea is because of the fact that coffee in traditional Arab Bedouin societies has always been that item or that thing that unites people through something that we call the diwaniya, which is when people sit down in traditional societies that used to be on a carpet in the middle of a tent, people would just sit down around a cup of coffee or on cups of coffee and just talk about society, culture, personal things that they're going through. Coffee was essentially what ignited conversations and communities. So that's why I created my podcast and I call it Gaho with Karim, because through coffee in a virtual and an e-sense online, we can ignite these conversations. So yeah, I can also send you my links if you're interested. That's much easier than spelling out my social media handles. So I think, yeah, I'll, I'll send them to you later. Yeah, all of those, all of those links will be in the show notes. So anyone can check you out on, on Twitter and Instagram. Check out your podcast, your few YouTube videos as your YouTube channel gets, uh, gets going out there. So yeah, all those are linked in the show notes. So check those out. But man, I love this conversation. I appreciate you taking the time and thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. This was a really interesting conversation. What's up, everybody? Thank you for tuning into that episode. And if you enjoyed it, click here for another full-length episode of the podcast. And please, don't forget to subscribe. But above all else, most importantly, please take good care of yourselves and others. And I'll see you next time. Lots of love. Cheers.